research into breast cancer, which I think will be really transforming women's lives, and she's just thrilled to be here. And finally, Sylvia, who at 79 is just putting in her PhD thesis, <laughs> another of our wonderful students. So you just get a flavour of the kind of women that we offer a Cambridge education for. Um, I'm going to introduce our first guest this afternoon. Harriet Harman has been one of my heroes for a very long time. When I started my career in journalism, I was a political correspondent for ITN. Uh, and I was in my early 30s, and I got pregnant, a planned pregnancy, I hasten to add. Um, and I was met with the news from my news desk that this was a ridiculous thing to do for a woman who wanted a career. And did I want the number of a, a good abortion clinic where I could go and get things sorted? So, no, I said thank you very much and went and told Harriet about this. Um, the next thing is a few months later, as my stomach grew a little bit, I was asked by my boss if I might not going downstairs to the members' lobby, which is where journalists are allowed to mix with politicians, because some Conservative MPs were upset by the sight of my pregnant belly. Um, and so it went on, because these were the late 70s, no, late 80s, whenever it was, Harriet, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. Um, and then I was suffering terribly from morning sickness, but I was made to stand outside press conferences for hours at a time. So all in all, I went to Harriet, who had had children before me, and said, Harriet, what am I going to do? So Harriet, being um, very tough in those days as she is now, went straight to my bosses and said, this can't carry on. You must let this woman sit down. You must let her have part-time work. Da -da -da. And as a result of Harriet's fighting for women's rights, uh, I was able to continue in political journalism and indeed in television journalism for many years, actually, um, going part-time and having the first job share at Westminster that was great, and so it's gone on. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Harriet, um, who's going to be talking to Martha, who was one of my other favourite journalists at Westminster. Martha, who's been around um, as long as I have, nearly Martha, haven't you? Um, and I think is one of the best female broadcasters we have. So Martha, I'll hand over to you now, and thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jackie Ashley and to Lucy Cavendish College for helping us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the World at One. We share our, our birthdays in this. And now over to um, Harriet Harman, who, who we know from your Spectator Diary this week, that you're spending your time, instead of sweating in preparation for Prime Minister's questions, you're tweeting pictures of kittens. Now, I can't quite believe that's all that you're up to, but I'm sure we'll find out uh, more about that. Um, Harriet Harman has been an MP for 33 years. She won the Peckham by election back in 1982. She's been a cabinet minister with responsibility for social security, solicitor general, and very relevantly for, for this gathering, the first ever minister for women. Uh, she was elected deputy leader in 2007, and then she's been acting leader twice in difficult circumstances for the Labour Party after election defeats. Now, very interesting, given what um, Jackie was just saying about women being pregnant in public life, because I have a very vivid memory when I was a very junior presenter on the AM programme at LBC, and you came into the studio to be interviewed, and this would have been in the early 80s, and you told me, as we were chatting before you came on air, that you were pregnant and you were about to go and have a scan, and it seemed so unusual back then for a politician to be, uh, to be pregnant and, and being in a front-line uh, front role like that, and I just wanted to take you back to those days and, and how difficult was it when it came to things like breastfeeding, for example? Um, well, I think it's, and by the way, hello everybody, and it's great to see um, everybody here, and all respect to Lucy Cavendish for all the amazing work that it obviously has done over the years and continues uh, to do. Um, I think it's always difficult if you're um, a minority, a small minority, and you're trying to do things in a different way, um, and you're trying to bring about change. And I think if you're trying to do that, it's always going to be very difficult. And I think if you bring into the mix the really difficult issue of parenthood, then um, it is very turbulent and difficult. But I, I think I've sort of concluded that there are um, few ways to get that uh, work balance right and many, many ways to get it wrong. And I actually think there are a few ways to get motherhood right and hundreds of millions of ways to get it wrong. And I think the thing, the only thing that you can do is to try and do your best at both. But of course, you're in a very different situation because 
For most people, there is still quite a marked division of labour within the home, with women still taking the main responsibility for the everyday care of children and indeed older relatives. And a lot of people say that is a very old fashioned point of view, that actually that's out of date, new man has arrived and is doing everything at home and I'm just a bitter and twisted feminist and I say, read the general household survey because that shows that actually new man might have arrived on the billboards and in his own mind, but he has not shown up in the kitchen. How about your own husband, Jack Roney? <laughs> about uh, my husband and I'm actually, although I swore I never would do it, I'm writing my memoirs now and I'm quite uh, taken aback in a way at actually how much support, I mean in my own mind I've done it all myself, is a heroic <laughs> struggle and actually at some quite inappropriate points I find that actually he has opened up doors for me in a way which doesn't fit the overall narrative and uh, supported me. So in terms of my work, he has been absolutely pivotal as it turns out. I mean, he helped me get my first job in the law center where he was working and he said, why don't you apply for the job? And then he helped me get a job on the NCCL as legal officer and he was on the executive, I notice. And he then was reading the papers and saw that Peckham was advertising for an MP and he suggested it. Um, but we were talking about the but, balance in the home. But, so basically, <laughs> full support um, in, in the work side. But I think the reality is for men of his and my generation, somehow it was expected that the most responsibility would rely on the women. And somehow I expected that as well. Um, and that did did make it make it hard. I mean, if ever I was, um, you know, well, yeah. So it did it did make it it did make it hard. And what was it like for you as a female MP in the early 80s? I know other women have said to me that there was a kind of solidarity amongst women from different parties. Sometimes that you would maybe meet in the women's room and discuss difficulties. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. I mean, I. The thing is that I had nothing at all in common with any of the very, very, very few uh, Tory women MPs. I just didn't, because we were about change, about social justice, about equality, um, about socio-economic rights, and they were conservatives. And, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean with a small c. And actually, the reality is, is that I would go round TV and radio studios arguing uh, for all the things that now are conventional wisdom, more maternity rights, paternity rights, equal pay, taking domestic violence seriously, and more women MPs, more women MPs, not just more Labour women MPs. And I would have Tory women MPs sent out after me to say this was all political correct nonsense, that it was patronising to women, that it was discriminating against men, and they were on the other side against me. And some of my side, of men, Labour side, would be like an echo chamber for them, criticizing the change we were making. So actually, we had masses of solidarity of the women's movement outside. Women in journalism, you know, like, like Jackie, women in the law, women in academia, women in trade unions, women in all sorts of walks of life, in the arts, in social work. We had that solidarity. That's what kept me going. But actually, uh, not any help at all um, and undermining from the Tory women MPs. I'm sorry, that doesn't fit the sense that we should all be in solidarity for, but I can only say that is the absolute truth of it. And it was, when you say, what was it like in the 1980s as a woman MP? Miserable, absolutely hard and miserable. With the hours going till the small hours of the morning on a regular basis, we never finished before 10. We didn't start until 2.30. And it was really, really hard going, but there was big support from the women's movement who was like, okay, you're in there, you're having a shit time, but it's because we've got to bring about change. So you've got to stick it out and you've got to argue for change and then more of us will join you and then we'll get the change. So it was like suffering, but in a good call. So what would you say were then were the main challenges for you in rising to more senior positions within the Labour Party? Um, well, because for people on my own side, to an extent, didn't see me as in politics. 
because I was arguing about a whole load of issues like childcare and maternity pay leave, which were not seen as serious issues. That, you know, you should be arguing about the money supply, about motorways, about the mines. And actually, one of the things that happened when we got all those women in in 1997, 100 Labour women came, is it not only changed the face of Parliament, but it changed the political agenda and made these issues, which had seemed like issues that should be confined to women's magazine, women's own, you know, things like that. It put them into politics, which is, of course, where they should be, because public policy was making decisions that affected women's lives, but without any cognizance about the different lives women were leading. I can remember a pivotal moment in that, actually, when there was an argument, quite a fierce argument between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, of course, one amongst many, but who was going to launch the national childcare strategy? Because they both wanted to do it. So I mean, there was a moment when, when there was actually kudos attached to that. But of course, actually, there isn't any point a man launching a childcare strategy. <laughs> because actually, the people who are tearing their hair out about childcare, by and large, are women. And actually, I don't think women want to hear men telling them what they're going to do about childcare. They want to hear women speaking up for women and making that change. So I give a sort of, you know, you know, no to both of those. <laughs> well, you, you fought um, a contest to become a deputy leader. You were successful in that, ended up beating Alan Johnson, I think, in, in the final round. When you became deputy leader, you didn't then have the role of deputy prime minister, which John Prescott had had as your predecessor. Uh, what do you think lay behind that? Well, I think partly uh, what possibly lay behind it is that I wasn't expecting to win. And therefore, I didn't have lots of plans about me as deputy leader. I'd only got into the campaign because I couldn't bear the shame that I felt would come upon Labour if we had a men-only contest. And we had all these men declaring themselves as candidates. And it was like, oh my God, are we actually going to have in the 21st century a men-only contest? And then we all started grumbling and then people started saying, well, you'll have to do it. And <laughs> so, so I kind of kept, went into it in order to hold up a banner for all those women in the party masses of councillors, masses of women members, you know, quite a lot of women MPs. Because we were going to have an existential problem otherwise. The idea that we have a roadshow all around the country of a kind of, you know, male panel talking about how great they all are, it was just insufferable. So basically, that's what the campaign had started off as. And therefore, I hadn't, and also the odds against me winning that the bookies had were literally ridiculous. I mean, I could have made my fortune if I'd have put a lot of money <laughs> on myself. So really, I was not expected to win. I was an absolute, what they call, rank outsider. So I think if I'd have put a lot of thought into it, I might have actually planned my demands of what I was going to do. But I was kind of a bit sort of, oh, you know, um, and before I kind of got my head into the fact that I'd actually won it and I was going to do it, Gordon has, had announced there wasn't going to be a deputy prime minister. So that was a public announcement that was quickly made. Um, and I think, actually, the reality is, is that if Alan Johnson had been elected, um, and, you know, I, I only beat him by 0.43%, so it was really narrow, narrow. But if he had have been elected, can anybody see that he wouldn't have been made Deputy Prime Minister? Of course he would have been. Um, but anyway, there we were. So, uh, looking back now, you've, you've been acting leader twice. Do you regret never having stood for the leadership itself? Um, no, um, I don't. I think that le I've been up close enough to leadership to realize it is a bit like ice skating. It looks easy, you glide about. Actually, it's much harder than it looks. And really, totally, you have to dedicate your entire, 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 entire life to it. And, you know, Having children, having now an elderly mother, you know, there was just a little bit of me that did not want to direct my entire, entire, entire life to it. But also, I'd had a, a kind of, you know, tied all my political life of every, you know, people uh, criticizing me as not serious or bonkers and everything. And so it would have felt like such a weird thing to stand 
for a leader. I mean, a lot of people, you know, in the media all said it was ridiculous he was standing as deputy. So, you know, I would have been very kind of up against it. And I think you need a leader um, who has, can make a broad reach and bring people in. Not, I'm a bit too much of a vanguardist, I think, to be a leader. I like fighting for a cause against all sides, including my own. Rather, I'm not so much of a, I notice, a bridge builder or a bringer of people, a bringer of people together. And I think in a leader, you have to be more all things to all people in a good way. But um, so I just think, you know, in every way, shape or form, it was never going to be on. And then it was a, a man who took over the responsibility of being leader from you, Jeremy Corbyn, and you made a rather good joke about him at the Spectator Parliamentarian of the Year Award. I think you've got a Lifetime Achievement Award. And you said you were surprised that somebody became leader who's older and posher than you. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I think there is an issue about age in women, though. Um, I think that um, for an older man, he can seem to be somebody who has gathered wisdom and experience <laughs> and maturity. For a woman, once she's past 60, many people just think she's past it. And this is my theory about the, 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 the three ages of man and the three ages of women. Because when a man is young, he's like dynamic, thrusting, purposeful, and he's having his prime. When he's middle-aged with four children, he is reassuringly virile and a family man, uh, and that's great. And when he's older, he's like wisdom and everything like that, maturity and experience and gravitas. For a woman, when she's younger, she's a bit distractingly pretty and therefore regarded as a bit flaky. Uh, she doesn't have a prime then. When she's got four children, she's obviously completely lost the plot and absolutely... <laughs> things have got completely out of control, so she's certainly not having her prime at work then. And when she's older, she's past it. So when is our prime? That's what I ask. When is it? I think I'm determined that we should all have our prime, those of you who are about my age, now. Um, so, uh, but we never have our prime, and men have a prime at every age. So you can be an older leader, and that's like marvelous, reassuring. No, you know, but anyway, there we are. Older women, that's a big issue, I think. So, Jeremy Corbyn there, yeah, perhaps in, in his prime, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and, and see about that. But how do you think Jeremy Corbyn is doing when it comes to the issue of women? I know uh, a number of, of new MPs are worried about the lack of women in senior posts in his shadow cabinet. Well, I think representation is very important because I think us women don't want to see um, a sort of men-only discussion. We want to see women and men talking together on equal terms, and we don't want to see women talking on women's behalves. Um, that is not sort of acceptable anymore. And therefore, I think representation is very important. And I think that because of the different lives women still lead compared to men, you do have to have a balanced team. Otherwise, you just see part of the picture. You don't see the whole picture. You know, just like you have to have MPs from all around the country. You need to have MPs of all ages. You need to have MPs of, of, of both genders and different minority ethnic communities. So I think representation is important in substance as well as in presentational terms. And I think that if you're a, a party that is arguing for women's advance and women are still not equal, it is very difficult to be a party arguing for women's advance when your top swathe is men. And at the moment, we have a male leader, a male deputy, a male general secretary, um, uh, a male London mayoral candidate, and we have a men in the Home Office, um, Foreign Office, um, uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, and I can't remember what the fourth one is, Great Office of State, somebody will remind me. Um, but that's not the fault of any of those individual men but it does create a presentational problem. And I think that the strand of the left that Jeremy comes from has never been a gender-motivated um, part of the left. Um, it comes from a time, in a way, when gender was a new insurgency uh, that arrived later on and was seen a bit of a distraction from the proper left-right struggle. And so... I think that we, you know, as women in the Labour Party, we have got to make sure that this problem 
is addressed because we are the party, the only party, that is going to actually bring about equality. If you look at what happens in government, um, when you have a Tory government, you know, you, you, you know, and I'm sorry to say this with Maria here and everything like that, and, you know, no doubt, you know, some of you here who are conservatives, but my experience and my reflection on the reality of it is, is you get a Labour government, you get the Sex Discrimination Act, the Equal Pay Act, Maternity Pay and Leave, the National Child Care Strategy. When you get the Tory government, you get, you, you know, you, you, you get the public services more struggling and they're very important for women, not only as employers, but as service delivery. So, you know, one of the reasons I'm in the Labour Party is to, to deliver for women. And therefore, I think it's very important that the Labour Party stays on the front foot internally as well in order to do its job it needs to do for women in the country. And I just think anybody who thinks that having a Tory government is going to help with women's further advance is sadly um, deluded. And we did have the paradox of the first woman prime minister being a Tory, but she was, we used to have that slogan, some of you might remember it, the first lady puts women last. I mean, actually she did not help uh, women's advance. Well, Maria Miller will be on a panel later on, so I'm sure she'll have uh, something to say about that, and, and we'll, we'll, we can certainly return to that issue. But on the question of the women in the top jobs of the Labour Party, what um, Jeremy Corbyn's people are, are saying, that that's an old-fashioned way of looking at these jobs, uh, Shadow Chancellor, Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, and so on, but actually the jobs that are equally important are in health and education. Um, they are very important jobs, but I'm, t I'm thinking about the, the leader the deputy leader, the general secretary, the London mayoral candidate, before you even get to the appointed jobs, there are those voted for jobs. Um, so even if we were, and I think we should uh, have some change, you know, if there's going to be a reshuffle, we, you know, Jeremy needs to think about how it's been perceived. Um, but I think there's an issue uh, about having a, a, a male leader and deputy. And there is a way, a very easy way to solve that, which is, that we can have an additional deputy who is elected either by all women in the party or all men and women in the party, but who is elected to be the additional deputy who is a woman. So we'd have a leadership team of three, of which one would be a woman, and she would be there in her own right, not appointed by Jeremy, but actually in her own right. That is very easy to do, wouldn't even cost anything, because we have elections every year in the Labour Party anyway. So. I think we should actually do that. We can't simply have a male leader and deputy and say, that's fine. It's not a balanced leadership team. And it looks like it's suffering from the same old entrenched into male dominated politics, which is why it wouldn't matter at all if we had a women only leadership team, because actually that is not the entrenched discrimination of past problems in politics. It's just different. What Jeremy Corbyn's supporters would say is what he has managed to do is galvanize the support of a lot of young people, of a lot of young women. So do you think, what do you think of the strategy to move the party to the left in terms of women at the next election? Well, I think the, the key to things is your, uh, is your final point, which is about winning the next election. I think that, um, you know, I, I'm in the Labour Party, as most, as, you know, most people are, to try and make a difference. Not to have a particular doctrinal purity, but to actually make a difference, to actually change the laws, to actually, you know, make public services better, to, to do all the things that we want to do that you can't do if you're not in power. So I think that the ultimate responsibility of a leader of the Labour Party is to, once they've got themselves elected, is to take us as a Labour Party nearer to power. That is... That is the most important thing, and that is what needs to happen, because we can protest about what the Tories are doing, but it's, but it's actually we've got to understand why it is that they are in government. They are in government because people voted for them in sufficient numbers and didn't vote for us in sufficient numbers, and we have to address ourselves to the electorate and also think about why so many we need to win the support of more women as part of that. So actually, it's about the doing it, not the talking about it. It's about the actual winning of the votes, not just about talking about the women winning votes. Um, and, you know, nobody's going to be happier than I if the Labour Party 
actually starts uh, increasingly winning the votes that we, we haven't been winning in the past. Is That's Jeremy, the bottom line. Is Jeremy Corbyn the man to do it? Well, you know, he's doing it, um, he's, he's arguing to do it in a different way than has been done before. And let's see how it works out. Um, you know, the point is not my relationship with Jeremy Corbyn. The point is the relationship between Jeremy Corbyn and the voters. That is the key relationship and um, in order to get Labour into power. That is the ultimate responsibility of a le Labour leader. You cannot be right and the public be wrong. Okay, we've got about five minutes left, so it'd be nice to try and take a couple of questions um, from the audience. If you'd um, stand up, and I think I'm sure we can hear you without the microphone, actually. Any questions? Yes, okay, lady up there. I think it is tough because um, the man will be then very much outside the stereotype, will be looked at askance um, at work, uh, their CV will look very different, but we had to fight for extra maternity leave and for childcare. We actually fought for it. Nobody came along and said, here you are, have it. Um, and where are the men fighting? Where are the great hordes of men fighting for extra maternity, for paternity pay and saying, this is a priority, where are they? So, so basically, I'd say when the men form themselves into a movement which is fighting for childcare, for parental leave, for flexible working, for uh, a year's paternity pay and leave, I'm gonna be right behind them. <laughs> But I don't see them yet, and until such time as they do that, we, as women, are still the ones that are doing it, and we have to fight for the services that ultimately, um, and the rights at work, which ultimately we are the main consumers of. And we had to break down barriers. You know, I feel sympathetic with a man who is like trying to break the mold and like being looked at askance at work because he's trying to do things differently. I feel sympathetic, but actually, I then say, and what are you doing about it? Because I was in the same position as a woman, as a young woman in the law. Everybody was thinking, what's she doing here? Um, this was a long time ago. And I fought, fought against that. So I'm not gonna afford men who are suffering from discrimination at work. I, I would afford them the argument that they get out and do something about it rather than do emotional blackmail of us because we've been fighting for a long time about it. They should get off their backsides and do something about it. Okay, and one last question. Yeah. Yep, you, if you'd like to ask a question, yeah, quickly if you can. Well, I think that in the welfare bill, what, what there was, it was a mixed bag. Some things that um, uh, we'd agreed with in our manifesto were in the welfare bill, like the welfare benefits cap was actually in the manifesto. Uh, the welfare bill, by the way, was something that was brought forward by the Conservatives sort of more or less immediately after uh, the general election that we lost. So it felt to me as if bearing in mind that we'd actually stood on a manifesto to say that we would have uh, a welfare benefit cap uh, to then oppose it when the Tories brought, brought it forward um, would look wrong. Um, and also they had in it the three million apprenticeships. Now, I'm very skeptical about how they're gonna make the reality of those apprenticeships, but the truth is that's what was in the bill, the three million apprenticeships. And usually what you do, if there's a bill where there's some things in it that you're in favor of and some things that you're very much against, you have what's called a reasoned amendment and then you abstain on the second reading and then you try and change it in the committee to support the things that you like and get rid of the things you don't like and then you vote against it on the third reading. So actually, with the public, we know very concerned about labor and welfare. We just absolutely know that. It was all around the country, including in Scotland. Um, it just seemed to me that we should, uh, you know, Either way, it was going to be a row. Either way, it was going to be a row. And, you know, sometimes being a leader is, um, at that point, is a bit like being one of those, I don't know whether it's Roman or something, whereby you're tied to 
two horses. You've got an arm and a leg on one horse and an arm and a leg on another horse, and the horses go off in different directions. And at that point, the public was going off in one direction and the Labour Party was going off in another, and I was the person between the two horses. So, Did you pick the right horse? No, but the point is you get, you, you get split down the middle, don't you? The horses go off in a different direction. There's not a right horse. Well, thank you very much for an interesting question. And thank you so much to Harry Armitage. She's in the middle thank of her writing her memoirs. So I think she's given us a flavour of how fascinating they're likely to be. Great to talk Have to you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. I'm very well, lovely to see you. Yeah, sure. Come and sit around here. work is changing. We don't go down coal mines anymore. It's all about the new technology. And women don't seem to be very much there in the new technology. So I have a great panel here to talk about lots of issues uh, involved with new technology. First of all, Sue Black, who is a tech entrepreneur, um, a social entrepreneur, and who's actually joining us here at Lucy Cavendish to set up a new centre for women in tech, which uh, we're just at the very early stages of uh, starting fundraising for. So Sue will talk a bit about that. But Sue has also been working on a, a wonderful BBC programme called Girls Can Code, uh, which I don't know if many of you saw, but it was really worth watching if you want to catch up with it. Um, Caroline Criado Perez is a journalist and campaigner, and many of you will remember that she dared to suggest that a women's a woman's face should appear on a banknote and was uh, then the recipient of a huge amount of trolling and nasty abuse, but uh, undaunted has carried on campaigning. And so, Caroline, welcome to you. Thank you. And Anne-Marie Imakadong is working for STEMEX, uh, which is uh, encouraging younger women into all these industries. So welcome to you all. I'd like to start, first of all, with you, Sue Black. Could you like to tell us, first of all, why there are so few women in the new tech industries and what we can do about it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, why are there so few women? I think looking back. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I might just take it off. Here. <laughs> oh, that's <good. laughs> I didn't want to hear your answer, really. No. That's what it was. Just not interested. No. <laughs> uh, why are there so few women in tech? Well, I think. Uh, going back just a few decades, actually, it was about 50-50. Talking to uh, women that were programmers in the 1960s, they said that, um, well, as far as I know, that uh, it was about 50-50 in those days. So, so what happened after that? I think various people have uh, different ideas about what happened. Um, I think it, it seems to be that when something uh, shows the potential to earn lots of people lots of money, the men come in and, uh, and basically mm. all the women start leaving because of the, the way the men are behaving or the way organisations are behaving. And I think basically that's what's happened. Um, also, you have to um, take into consideration the way that the media has portrayed technology over the years mm. and, um, and the fact that also that um, uh, computers went into schools in the 1980s. Uh, talking to Professor Wendy Hall, uh, she always says that... Um, when they put one computer in the classroom, then that one computer, because of the way boys and girls behaved, the boys went to the computer.
computer, the girls waited to be asked to use a computer, so the boys got the computer. So boys grew up with, with uh, some programming knowledge, and um, so I think it's a combination of all those factors, probably. Computers started making lots of money, so kind of like men mustered in. Oh, sorry, oh, I mean, that sounds terrible. No, I, lo I, lo <laughs> <laughs> I love men. I, I no, you don't. I think <laughs> Society basically is misogynist, and that's the issue. It's not because lots of people talk about the men against women. I don't think it's men against women at all. I think we live in a misogynist society. I think back in the caveman, cave women times, um, the kind of the way that the the genders uh, behaved made sense. But we've still got some of that behaviour now, and it's just completely irrelevant now. But we're still kind of stuck uh, with that kind of culture. So I think it's it's um, men and women working together for a future where we're not stuck in that misogynist uh, culture anymore. Um, it's probably, Sue, as soon as I start talking, I can't stop. So sorry, people. <laughs> Sue, you've been um, obviously teaching girls to code, but also mums. You've done a lot with net mums, teaching mums to code. Um, now, I've actually had a, a distinguished Cambridge academic say to me that girls and women's brains are just different. And the reason they don't do things like coding and technology is their brains are different, aren't they? And I'm sort of... Can we, no. have, can we have um, a name, please? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah, later. exactly. Um, but I mean, how do you answer that kind of criticism? I think you just say fuck off. Actually. <laughs> 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 it's just such a stupid thing to say. He should just go away and look at himself and you know, <laughs> think about what he's saying. I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> but do you find when you when you encourage people? mums and girls to come into coding, they think, oh, we can do this after all. It's not just a male to a male. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, I just find that whole position ludicrous. Um, I run a social enterprise called Tech Mums, and we teach mums in disadvantaged areas stuff like web design, app design, social media, uh, and coding in Python. And I, I just, one of the absolute joys in my life is teaching East End market stall holders to code in Python. And then suddenly realise that actually they can do it. And, you know, we can all do it. It's, it's just ludicrous to say things like that. I have to say, I've determined to learn Python and coding. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't do it. When I came to Cambridge, I thought I'd take up German again and get my German going. But I think coding is the answer. Mm. Uh, which brings me to education. I mean, do we need to see much more done in schools and indeed in universities? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've got Anne-Marie here who's running an amazing project called STEMX which is getting girls all across the country, and I'm sure it will be all across the world quite soon, getting girls into coding. So, yeah, we need it all the way through the education system, um, and we've got some great initiatives that we can draw on to really make that happen. Now, tell the audience here a little bit more about the Centre for Women in Technology <laughs> that we're setting up. So, at this Cavendish College, it's, oh, God, I can't even say it. College. At, it's a, I shouldn't have drunk that bottle of vodka this morning. <laughs> <laughs> at Lucy Cavendish College, we're setting up uh, a centre of excellence for women in technology. What we really want to do is to um, take action and make a change. So, we're going to be working to pull together all the research that's out there around women in technology, work out uh, where the gaps are, seek to fill those gaps so that we've got a solid platform of research to then... Uh, advise everyone on best practice in terms of getting more women uh, working in their companies, how to make their organisations uh, much more um, what's the word? Um, inclusive. Amenable. Inclusive. Yeah, mm. inclusive. Thanks, Anne. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Any time. <laughs> um, and uh, really get out there and kind of like bang the drum for women in technology, empower women around women in technology. So not only are we going to uh, have a hub where we'll be uh, conducting that research and, and getting the best practice out there. But it'll also be a hub for people to come in, for women to come in. We're going to promote uh, and encourage women entrepreneurs and support them too. Um, we're going to be doing lots of things, holding events. So what's the anyone would like to talk to us at any point during the day, please come and chat to me and Jackie. Well done, you've got the plug-in. <laughs> <laughs> Anne-Marie, let's bring you in here. D tell us, first of all, what the STEMX do. So the STEMX, we run events and um, experiences for girls aged between 5 and 20. It's all about... You 
with this one. With this one. So. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Fantastic, cool. I'll start again. Um, so with the, the Stimets, um, we run events and experiences for girls, um, and that being the British version of the word girl, so five up to 21, not women, as the Americans um, like to call their women girls. Um, and it's all about them meeting women in industry, so women that work across science, technology, engineering, and maths careers in the places where all of this happens, so at places like Accenture or at places like Centrica, um, and it's all about opening it up to the girls. Um, everything that we do is free, they always have fun, and there's always food, um, <laughs> and that's how we reel them in, um, and it is just about giving them that kind of positive experience with STEM, rather than it being the negative, girls don't do STEM, it's not really for me type environment, which they might have at school or sometimes in the home. I need to pick that back go. up here, sorry about this. We'll get ourselves sorted in a moment. Um, how much do you think things like computer games are important in that they do seem to be designed by men, played for by boys? Is that somewhere where we need to start to look as well to get girls really not to feel afraid of computers, computing and software? blames computer games and the, the fact that they were really heavity, heavily marketed at men and at males kind of in their bedrooms at the kind of decline of women in computer science. Um, if you look at the stats though today, so, you know, a lot of people are gamers, so I, I guess in this room I'm not sure, but how many of you here have ever played a computer game before or play games on your phone? Um, and if we look at the proportion of gamers that we have, um, actually I think now it's getting more to equal um, numbers of, of girls that are playing versus men playing or versus boys playing. Um, so I think that's definitely somewhere to start off. Um, but you're right, you know, in terms of creating the game and the people that are behind this, you have a lot of men that are working in the industry that are the ones that are doing the coding, even developing the storylines and the plots. Um, and sometimes that can kind of come undone. So um, there's an example of a really popular game that very recently they've decided to include female characters. So you can choose to have, so it's a traditional shoot em game, but you can choose to have a female character. But of course they've still written the storyline and the plots with very masculine and very male um, type um, words and descriptions and you know, saying, oh, you, you know, you're running like a girl, for example, which if you are a female character, then of course you're <laughs> running like a girl because you are a girl. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely a lot that they need to do around thinking of, of that and having characters, but not taking the lazy route. So the other example we see was um, a couple of years ago, Angry Birds. So most people here will have heard of Angry Birds brought out a pink bird called Stella. Can you just explain to people that don't know what Angry, angry Birds, birds is? Angry Birds is a fantastic game of birds that are angry. Um, and you, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of propel them at pigs. Um, it's free. Go, go, go download it and, and be a gamer. Um, but yeah, they brought out this pink bird and the idea was that that would entice girls and it's like, you know, all girls love pink. So of course that worked. Yeah, it didn't. Um, <laughs> but it's, ha it's having, if you have those people in your organizations and driving that, then um, you're definitely able to have more inclusive games. And girls really love to be creative. Um, so when we work with them and we do encourage them to build games and we do run events where they get to build their own games, it's quite interesting actually when you see them creating and what it is that they create and the characters and the storylines that they put in and you know what they're building. And, and that's something that then can spur off the, that kind of love of computer science because everyone loves a good game. And yet there's still precious few women going into computer science nationwide, so we need to do something about that. Definitely. Um, I think we, we need to do something on the academic route, but also on apprenticeships and even just the career in, in, in general. Um, so at the moment in industry, I think only 46% 40, uh, of people in industry um, have, have, have no STEM background at all. So it's definitely not something that you need to have studied it or need to have gone via that route. But it's just about having that interest and seeing and understanding that there's a lot of options and there's also a lot of space for people to come in and get involved. Um, and I think we mentioned it um, a little bit earlier, things like pay, you get paid pretty well working within this industry. So parents that are discouraging their girls from pursuing it, that's one, one reason to kind of go into it. But for the girls, you know, things like free food and swag and being <laughs> creative is, is definitely a reason to pursue it. And also, Sue, I'd have thought it's, a, it's an ideal profession for someone who wants to have a family because you can do it as long as you're connected, as long as you have inter internet connection, which is something I'm struggling with. Um, but if you have internet connection, then you can, do, you can work from home, you can work in the middle of the night, you can work part-time. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, also, you can set up your own business. You know, I mean, it's very much easier now to become an entrepreneur because of the way technology connects us all together and connects us with everything around us that we need to use. Right, I'm going to come to Caroline. Let's hope Caroline's microphone is working. Um, I think it is. Now she's taking her necklace off. 
Caroline, we're, go we're going to discuss a slightly different, I'll pass you this, a slightly different issue with you. So I wonder if we could start, if you could just tell us about um, how you came to fame, I suppose, I should say. Oh. Uh, um. <laughs> how did it come about Sorry, that you I'm were suggesting okay. a woman on a banknote? Right. Um, uh, the banknote thing. Okay, fine. So the banknotes. Um, well, it, can I just say something else, actually, first? Because I thought it was very interesting what... Anne-Marie was saying about the, the computer games, because I hadn't heard of those examples, but one example I use, um, I talk about quite a lot, because I just think it's hilarious, is the one of, um, uh, uh, oh God, and now I've forgotten its name. What's the, the one where they roam around LA and like pick up women? Oh, GTA. And, GTA, yeah. yeah, sorry. GTA, Grand Theft Auto, which is like a sort of vice game. Um, and it's always been from the perspective of men. Um, so you've always had male players. And what I really liked was in GTA V, they still made it just men. And the reason for that was that they said, um, well, we needed to have a narrative arc. Um, and obviously you can't do a narrative arc with women because women don't have narratives. Uh, but anyway, they gave women in, they put women in the online version. And um, I went and looked at it, sort of thinking, I'm going to catch them out. This is going to be fun. Because I've got a real obsession with the idea of male default, which is connected to the banknotes, I promise. Um, and uh, they... Uh, so they, put, they made up these women, and they looked quite good, and I went in trying to catch them out, and I thought, well, you could put makeup on the women. I bet you can't put makeup on the men, but you could put makeup on the men. So, you know, I didn't manage to get them on that, which was great. But what I did get them on was, I think you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, so you can drive around as if you're the guy, but, you know, you're a woman, and you look like a woman, and you can still pick up a prostitute as a woman. Um, and so you go around, and you get this woman in your car, and you've got these various options that you can choose. And so you think, oh, you know, this is my first time. I'll probably just spend $50. Um, and what can you get for $50? <laughs> and then the woman comes towards you, and her head goes down into your lap, and then it starts going up and down. And you're like, I don't have one of them. I just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's not really... It's not really doing anything for me. Um, so <laughs> I just think that that's a really, really useful uh, way of... Like, it's a really useful analogy of what a world looks like when you design it around men and then you just sort of put women in it and you expect everything to be fine. And actually what you need to do is build this world thinking about the fact that sometimes there are little differences between men and women that you might want to account for. Um, and, and the reason this connects brilliantly to banknotes is, is that when you have a world that is reflected back to you as 80% male, which is more or less what we have, um, when we, when we start to get equality, it tends to get stuck at about 20% for some reason. Um, so women make up 17% of crowd scenes in Hollywood films, which I think is fascinating. It's just the people in the background. It's just 17% women. Um, only 28% of speaking roles are women. 29% uh, of parliament is women. 13% uh, of global media stories um, have women as the main subject. Um, so it's, uh, it's just sort of wherever you look, women are massively underrepresented. And the problem with this is that it leads people to, f to sort of see women as a minority in a way. Um, we don't really see people as uh, women as 100%, as, as sort of 50%. And just to give you an example of how this sometimes works, um, they did this fascinating study which was cited by Gina Davis who set up this organisation looking at um, how women are represented in Hollywood media. And they looked at men's... Um, men's perceptions of gender mixes when they looked at mixed group. Um, and they found that when it was 17% women, the men thought it was 50-50. And when it was 33% women, the men thought women were in the majority. Um, and I can't help thinking that might be slightly connected to the way the rest of the world is represented. Um, another ex interesting example of this is when I was campaigning for banknotes, I had this very irate gentleman uh, talking to me. Actually, he was tweeting me. Um, and he said, women are everywhere now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like it was this really bad thing. Um, but patently, we weren't everywhere now because we were about to be taken off the back of banknotes. So anyway, so onto the banknotes. We were about to be taken off the back of banknotes. So the Bank of England announced that um, uh, the only woman who was Elizabeth Fry, she was on the five pound note, was going to be removed and replaced with Winston Churchill. So we were going to have an all-male lineup. Um, and because of the work that I'd been doing so far, I set up an orga organization called The Women's Room um, because only 20% of experts in the media are women, um, and obviously that doesn't reflect the expertise of women in real life. Um, so there you go, there's another 20% example. Um, 
And, uh, and so this was just going to be another area in which women were going to be wiped out. Uh, we're, not, you know, we're not included in history, we're not included in the school curriculum. And this was just going to be another area. And also it was so unnecessary. So I just sort of, honestly, I just thought, this is such a stupid decision. It's clearly an oversight. I'll just tell the Bank of England, look, you've, you've made a mistake. Um, and they would say, gosh, you're right, thanks. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll just go and change that now. We'll make them all women. Um, and inexplicably, they didn't. And um, they, they actually fought really hard. They hired like the most expensive lawyers in the country because, you know, they're the Bank of England and they make the money. Um, so they had a lot of it. And I didn't because I was a student and I didn't have any money. Um, so uh, we, we, wrote, we crowdfunded, um, which is, you know, another amazing aspect of the internet. So you can create these movements and you can take on a massive institution that as, you know, I don't want to labor the point, but they do actually print the money. And I, I don't know how this works. I'm looking at Maria because I figure she probably knows how it works. I imagine they probably can't just go and take the money. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they have access to it. Um, and, and you can... As, as, you know, create this movement where you can take on this massive institution. So we did, and we won. Um, and they not only agreed to put Jane Austen on the next £10 note, but they've also, which was much more important for me, agreed to change the selection procedure. Because that, for me, was the important bit. Because it's about how you're taking decisions. And again, it goes back to this idea of male default. If you create a selection procedure that has been, uh, you know, created with men in mind, so things like um, must have good artwork, must have good name recognition. Well, we write women out of history. How are we going to have women with good name recognition? Um, or, you know, and, and it obviously extends beyond women as well. So, you know, if, if you've had racial discrimination, how are you going to have good artwork of anyone prior to about 1980, if even then? So there were all these s objective selection criteria which were making it just so likely that we were going to get an all-male white lineup, which is what we were consistently getting. Um, so we won that. Do you want me to stop now? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I could go on forever. Yeah. Well, no, I um, also want you to tell us about the backlash. Well, that's what I was about to move on to. Extraordinary. Um, so this is this is the dark side of the net, guys. Um, you build a movement, and then and then these people who don't like you, they also build a movement, and that's that's the rape threat movement. Um, not a very catchy name, but you know, very popular amongst a certain section of society. Um, so yeah, uh, it was it was it was so weird, but it really was. You know, the forces that I had been able to use that enabled me to take on this big institution like the Bank of England, enabled all these very disgruntled people to take on this big institution called Caroline Criado Perez, um, and to send me the most graphic and violent and frankly terrifying uh, rape and death threats. Um, really specifically talking about you know, which part of their body or which implement would be used to go into which part of my body, uh, how I'd be mutilated um, and begging to die. They found an address that was connected to me, posting it all over the internet, um, and made it very clear that they were hunting me down to try and uh, rape, torture, and then finally kill me. Um, and what that was, it became very, very clear when I looked at the wording of what was being sent to me, what it was about, was about telling me to shut up. Um, so many of the threats referred to my mouth, my speech, um, slitting my throat. Uh, one guy was um, particularly forthright. I'm very grateful to him to telling me exactly what he wanted. Some of them were just saying, you know, I'm going to rape you in X way. This guy gave me options. So he said, shut your whole mouth or I'll shove my dick down your throat and choke you with it which is very nice and specific, so I knew what he wanted me to do, and that was to shut up. Um, and so, obviously, I wasn't prepared to shut up. Um, and the th final thing I just want to say is that when this was in the media, you had a lot of commentators talking about, you know, all these dreadful, dreadful feminazis who just want to qu crush people's free speech. Um, and obviously, this is a free speech issue. And to them, I'd say, yes, you're right. It is a free speech issue. It's my free speech that is being challenged here. I have people telling me they're going to kill me unless I shut up. If that's not a free speech is issue in respect of women, I don't know what is. I just want... to ask because it just sounds so utterly bizarre when you tell the story that you were campaigning to get more women's faces on banknotes and that prompted these 
rape and death threats. It seems utterly you bizarre like when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> banknotes are very important, <laughs> and I really appreciate what you've done for banknotes. But I mean, it, did it strike you at first as sort of beyond ridiculous, or was it just absolutely terrifying? Well, it, it was both. You know, it was obviously it was terrifying because you know I didn't know who these people were, I didn't know where they were, I didn't know how many of them there were, um, and I had no way of knowing how capable they were of carrying out these threats. Um, but Obviously, it is also completely baffling. When you, you sort of take it down to its bare essentials, what I was asking for was a line drawing on a piece of paper. Um, and the fact that people found that so threatening that they had to send me these, these hordes of rape and death threats is, I think, very sad in terms of what it tells us about society and how actually we, was, we have perhaps not come as far as we think we have. Um, and I, I think that what it what the what it represented was a huge amount of fear that's the only way to explain such an extreme overreaction i mean you call women hysterical i don't know about you i think sending someone rape threats over a line drawing is pretty hysterical um but what it suggested to me was that this came from a huge place of fear and i think what it is is slightly connected i love harriet Harman for saying the thing about you know men need to form their own movement because you bloody do but um you know, men do, we, what we've done with feminism, because it has been focused on women, and that's sort of understandable, because women are the ones who are being uh, discriminated against, is we've managed to shift to a certain extent what women are allowed to be, what we're allowed to do, but we really haven't addressed what men are allowed to be and what men are allowed to do. And so men still have to fit into this very, very tiny, stereotypical, you know, like wrestling with bears, uh, growing a beard, chopping wood, um, whatever it is you guys do to feel manly. Um, and, and if you have as this very strict idea of what masculinity is, so you've got all this dominance and leadership and public speaking. I mean, speaking in public is a hugely, um, historically has been hugely defined by masculinity. And then you have these bloody women in, you know, making these incursions into it. And then you have men who have so rely on their sense of masculinity as this is what men do. And don't haven't you know we haven't redefined what masculinity means. I think for me that was the only way I could make sense of how you could have such a ridiculous overreaction. It had to be something more like, you know, basically an existential crisis. Um, so I don't even remember what your question was. We well, did. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. I, I, I don't know if you've got a microphone that works. Let's hope so. But um, you're a great tweeter, and um, I'm, certainly I know, and a lot of the journalists here will also know that we get all sorts of rubbish on Twitter for even saying something relatively uncontroversial. Um, do women get much more attacked, do you think, than men on Twitter on social media? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, is your thing? Yes, I think they do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I haven't done a survey or anything, but in my experience and people that I've spoken to, yes, women get attacked uh, in that way a lot more than men. I think the, uh, does everyone know about the Everyday Sexism Project, uh, which Laura Bates set up? I think that's really, really interesting what's come out from that. Um, Laura Bates, if you don't know, um, was kind of assaulted or um, catcalled three times in one day. Um, and just thought, that's enough. I need to do something about this. I, I'm fed up with, with being called whatever name, walking down the street, or someone trying to grab my ass or whatever. Um, so she set up Everyday Sexism and asked other people to send in their experiences to see, was it just her, which of course it wasn't, but how much was it happening to everyone else, and, and who was it happening to? And um, she was completely deluged with women sending in their stories of what was happening to them. And so anyone can tweet with the uh, hashtag Everyday Sexism. You can also post on the Everyday Sexism uh, website uh, if you send your experiences in. And I think it's been really revealing for, for all of us mm. to see really what's going on. And I think, you know, like, I'm getting on a bit now, um, but... You know, like, so all of my life, especially when I was younger, I had shit like that, you know, with, with just men saying ridiculous things to you on the street. And I think, actually, one thing that really horrified me was that, um, was walking down the street, I've got four children, when my oldest daughter was about 10, so she was still at primary school, walking along the street, and, and some guy checking her out, you know, like, she wasn't even very tall, she wasn't she hadn't gone through puberty. There were men checking her out already. And um, I just think all of this kind of, I don't even know what to call it, but just bad behavior. It's just been going on for such a long time. And, and it's great now that with social media, 
with technology, we can all get those stories out there and then we can all connect to each other and do something about it. The only, I mean, there is a small problem with it, which is that there are these really deeply pathetic men who stalk the everyday sexism hashtag. And they reply to every woman who, and the reason I know this is that often people will tag me when they tweet something at everyday sexism. And I will always end up with a mention full of men going, me, me, me. <laughs> um, you know, why are you, I don't know, just attacking women. So a woman will have revealed this really traumatic event that's happened to her and every single time. Um, and similarly in, in the, the gaming industry, and Amri will know this, there was this huge thing called Gamergate, which was again, men fighting against just these really tiny things that women were asking for. Um, so there is this huge resistance against it. And I didn't, you know, not all men hashtag, but it really is not all men. I think it is minor minority of rather tragic men who uh, don't feel confident in their masculinity and therefore women asking for equality is very threatening to them. But it is a, it is a problem. For Anne-Marie, presumably for younger women in particular, it is very off-putting and actually quite scary. Um, yeah, definitely. So uh, we all know we had... Do you want Go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, Sue will know, we ran a programme this summer for young female entrepreneurs, so girls aged between 11 and 22, um, and we gave them the skills to run their own tech startups, and one of the ideas that came out of it was Holler App. So these are girls who are aged between 13 and 18, who've developed a wearable that you put on, that if someone doesn't have enough money to drink, they can just hit a button that it will make a call to where you are. You have, you have to hold the... You have to hold, I have to hold it like this? Yeah, okay. Hold the hold the thing together. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll do this. <laughs> They're used oh to male God. voices. We've in been the using union. it wrong. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah. So sorry. So we we ran this program over the summer, and they came up with this idea, this wearable, to help cat combat catcalling. Um, and that the idea is that it records where you are. It records one minute of audio, um, and it can then pinpoint like, the nearest CCTV camera. So then you can actually submit something to the police or whoever else it is to record it. And you think, you know, we we gave them a blank canvas. We said you can build anything in the world, and these teenage girls, that was what they built. So it is, it is quite, it's quite sad that it's something that they're very aware of, and, and it, it doesn't make them feel comfortable at all. I think what's what's most interesting about them and a discussion that we've been having with Laura actually is, you know, even with things like Gamergate, a lot of times you have bots that are the ones that are responding that are doing this. That pe people, uh, so like robots almost, oh, that people have built built quite sophisticated programs that do the trolling for them. So we had a, we had a really interesting discussion about you know do we get some some you know great developers together to then build an anti trolling bot yeah. <laughs> yes, and then yes, it just yes, becomes yes, yes. then we just flood yeah so it was like you know then we flood it um, and we've seen that happen previously so th this uh, it was a similar competition last year there was a team who built something who built a, a program called don't do this or don't tweet that so they went it went through and it auto it was automated it went through Twitter and it found anything that was vaguely abusive or aggressive or threatening like and it tweeted back to that person, don't tweet that. And what they found was that this bot calling people out, they then either stopped tweeting it, or some of them actually replied and said, I'm really sorry <laughs> for tweeting <laughs> that, not realizing that it was an automated bot, it wasn't a human being that was going against them. So I think I'm, I'm a technologist, I've always been one. I think I'm very much one of, let's find a solution, let's fight, te fight fire with fire, fight technology with technology. Um, I am recruiting developers, I guess, for this thing um, with, with Laura, the anti-trolling troll. Um, but, but you're right, I think girls are very, very conscious of it, they're very aware of it, um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's challenging, really. Perhaps if they know it's all bots anyway, it, it will make it less worrying. Perhaps, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe it will just stop. All power you know, to your, to your anti-trolling bots. Um, <laughs> we've got a few minutes for questions, so if anyone would like to ask a question specifically of one, or um, any questions for any of the panel here. Yes, the lady over there, could you try shouting, and, and if not, we'll get... Oh, well done, thank you. <laughs> oh, that makes us all feel hopeless.
Okay, so um, I did actually go to the police. I didn't know that I could, um, and I was encouraged to by some friends, and they pointed me towards an online reporting uh, form, which I filled out. And uh, I would probably never report again unless I felt my life was 100% massively in danger, because uh, dealing with the police was about as traumatic as getting the rape threats in the first place. Um, because uh, you are dealing with people who don't understand the internet, so you're having to explain how to Twitter works, go through all the rape threats about a million times, you know, reading again and again these things that are going to be done to you, um, to because the police lost evidence, because they didn't understand how to find the evidence. Um, and, uh, I mean, it, just to, to sort of round it off to explain to you how terrible it was, I had a wonderful woman um, who was supporting me. She works for Paladin, the stalking, National Stalking Network, and uh, she trains police officers, and she said um, that the way they dealt with me was so incompetent that she wouldn't actually be able to use it as an example because it wouldn't be believable in training. Um, so my experience of the police was pretty bad. Having said that, they did manage to find a couple of people, um, but you know it was this, the tip of the iceberg. I don't feel like they even tried to find most of the people, um, and you know one of the people they found was found by Newsnight. Another person was tweeting under his own name, so, <laughs> so <laughs> with his own photograph and a link to his website where he sold um, protective body armor. Um, he was he was an interesting man. Um, yeah, and then my experience with the CPS as well was this, this particular guy who tracked down um, various addresses, um, old addresses I'd lived at, work addresses. He tracked down my work history, my relationship history, the addresses of my family, uh, my brother and my mum, and uh, was blogging about me, set up loads of different Twitter accounts, tracking every single thing I did, made various uh, videos all about me and how I was the head of a witch's coven. That was interesting. Um, and was tweeting about how he was going to buy a gun and uh, you know how much death the gun could buy him. Um, anyway, the uh, you know sort of if he'd been doing that offline, it would have been a fairly clear, clear cut case of stalking. Um, but because it was online, the CPS sort of were obsessed with making it offensive, malicious communications. I wasn't offended, I was terrified. Um, and the CPS actually told me that one of the reasons they didn't prosecute him for stalking was because when I was on news night, I wasn't crying and tearing my hair out, I was kind of trying to present a brave front uh, that that meant I hadn't behaved sufficiently like a victim, so they couldn't. So essentially, no, my experience of the police and the CPS is pretty bloody negative, um, and I probably wouldn't go through that again. Um, as for sort of digging my heels in, I mean, one of the reasons I did that was because I knew that this was a thing that happened to other women. And I felt uh, like I had a duty not to be cowed by it. I felt, and that was the reason why, I, as well, I went on news night not crying and tearing my hair out, was because I felt I had a duty to represent myself as not cowed by these people so that other people could not be cowed too and women could carry on tweeting and being in the public space. Because I know a lot of women you know, I had a lot of women actually get in touch with me saying thank you so much for not backing down because it happened to me and I did and I shut down my quits Twitter account and I stopped blogging. Um, so I think for those of us who feel we have the emotional strength to carry on, I think it, it behoves us to do that. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. <laughs> okay. So if there's no other hands up, you can come back. Right, I'm afraid that, fascinating as this is, and because we're on to something.
work. Right. No? Is that working? That's better. Right. Hello, everybody. I'm very sorry about this microphone trouble. I'm told it's all in the people using them rather than the mics, but I'm skeptical. <laughs> uh, anyway, we've got there now, I think. Um, right, a complete change of gear now. We're going to be talking about um, women and caring. Um, because as we have uh, an, an aging population, more and more people are living longer, which is wonderful, but more and more people are living with some kind of illness and disability, and often multiple. And uh, a lot of people will need care in their later years, and guess who does the majority of the caring? Yes, it's women. Um, now, Carers UK is a wonderful organisation who I've done some work with, and Helena Haircloth here is its chief executive. She's going to be talking um, to us about what they're doing for the six and a half million carers we have in the country at the moment. And then she is going to introduce Jane Hawking, who uh, really needs no introduction, as the lady who cared for Stephen Hawking, and uh, she's going to be telling us her story. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Helena. Thank you, Helena. Thank you. So take this microphone. Thank you very much, Jackie. How's that? Can you hear okay? Yeah. Excellent. That's the first bit done. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Jackie and Lucy Cavendish College, for inviting us to take part. Um, just fantastic discussions already. I almost forgot I was coming up to speak. I got so uh, uh, carried away by the, the previous discussions. Um, it is Carers UK's 50th anniversary this year as well. In fact, on Wednesday, the actual day that we started as a charity. So it's particularly lovely to be here and to join in uh, the celebrations of the 50th here as well. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the remarkable woman that founded Carers UK and then talk a little bit about the situation uh, of caring today. So the story is about a woman called Ruby Mary Webster, known as Mary because her mother's name was Ruby. And she was someone of a deep, deep Christian faith and she grew up in the Church of England uh, and as we know, in the 1940s and 1950s, the church hadn't quite got that enlightened and was not yet ordaining women. So she switched denominations, joined what was then the Congregationist Church, now the United Reformed Church, and was ordained as a minister. Uh, so very much a trailblazer in many ways. She was an unmarried daughter. And as her parents got older, there was an expectation that she would care for them. And Mary found herself in a situation where, first of all, she had to reduce the working that she did before actually giving up not only her work, of course, but a lot of the way in which she showed her vocation. And caring as a single daughter for elderly parents in the 1950s and 1960s, there was no recognition of what you did. There was no financial support, there was no legal framework. Many, many women found themselves in poverty and found themselves almost literally shut away. And in fact, Mary coined a phrase then, which is almost as powerful now, and she said it was like being under house arrest. Her whole world has sh had shrunk to just looking after her elderly parents. And she thought, well, maybe some other women are in the same situation. If she'd been alive today, she would have taken to social media, I'm sure, and within days uh, would have started a me movement. Uh, but she did what you did at that time. She wrote to the press. She wrote to the Guardian, in fact, amongst others, and described her situation and wondered whether other women might be in the same situation. And she was inundated, literally sackfuls of posts from women saying this was the situation they were in, they were caring, unpaid for their parents, with no recognition. So Mary set about starting what we now know as the carers' movement. She was a very astute lady. She sought people of influence in politics and the media to gather together, to form an organisation, to gain recognition for women, to gain legal rights, and to help women to support each other. And she set up the charity that was then called the National Council for the Single Women and Her Dependents. <laughs> so I'm quite relieved we've had uh, a bit of a name change since then. <laughs> and I want to just read a very short extract from 50 years ago on Wednesday, the launch of this remarkable organisation, which tells us a little bit about how things have changed and maybe a little bit also 
about how things are the same. This was written by Baroness Summerskill in, uh, in uh, 1967, and she talks about that gathering in Parliament to launch the new charity. As I looked at this packed gathering of middle-aged single women, I was struck by the general shabbiness undoubtedly stemming from a life of self-denial. At the sad, unsmiling faces, for a life dedicated to the care of the elderly leaves little room for cheerful social contacts with younger people. When question time came, except for one or two inquiries, the audience remained silent. Not because their minds were not crowded with questions which they had asked themselves constantly over the lonely years, but because the silence imposed by habit cannot be easily broken. Aged parents often fail to recognise that a devoted daughter is a grown woman and continue to treat her as a child. Their querulous demands on her time and energy must inevitably undermine her will to resist, with the result that she finds in withdrawal her only defence against ceaseless claims on her generosity. Now, since those times, 50 years ago, the charity has changed hugely. We are now a charity uh, for men and women. In fact, for the six and a half million people in this country who are caring unpaid for a loved one. That might be elderly parents, it might be a disabled child, it might be a partner uh, who's ill uh, or has a disability. Every single year, two million people start caring for someone. And about that same number come to the end of that caring experience. So this is an issue that affects us all, men and women. And yet it is an issue that still predominantly affects men. So 58% of carers are women, but 42% of carers are men. But if you look at that in a bit more detail, you'll find that women are more likely to have given up work to care or reduced their hours to care. And one in three women carers are looking after an elderly parent, and the responsibility of caring for parents is still more likely to fall on the female family members. And because we have an ageing population, which is good news, because it's certainly better than the alternative, it does mean that people are caring at different times in their life. So we talk about sandwich carers, where you're caring for younger children and older parents, and you're sandwiched in the middle. And an academic has also uh, looked at how we can go in and out of caring and has coined a, a rather sinister phrase, which is serial carers. Um, <laughs> but you get the picture. This is one of those issues that affects us all. All of us at some point in our lives will either be caring for someone or need that care ourselves. So this is not just a huge issue for women and for men. It is not just a huge issue for individuals. It's one of the biggest challenges facing society right now. And we know that caring has a huge impact on your health, both mental and physical. It is and can be enormously draining. You can feel completely isolated. It has an impact on your finances as well. And fundamentally, you can feel isolated and invisible, particularly women can feel isolated and invisible because you're behind the person and the person is often asked how they are, but you as the carer quite often are not asked how you are. So some of the things that we're campaigning to change is much greater recognition amongst employers about the flexibility that's needed and a right to paid care leave. It should be as normal to talk to your employer about needing to take time off to care for your elderly mum with dementia as it is to talk about childcare. We simply must have a radically new way of understanding that all of us at some point will either need that help or be providing that care. So let me finish with a couple of things. Coming back to this book, um, and this was from 1971, so a little bit more recent, and it reflects um, uh, discussion, a debate in Parliament, and this was written by William Hamling, Hamling MP, who was uh, putting an amendment forward on the Finance Bill, so looking to uh, put forward further rights. And he said this, I often think that it is because they are women 
that their needs are not met. If they were men, they would stand up and demand change. It is not in the nature of women to stand up and demand. They ask nicely. They are turned down nicely, but they are still turned down. Well, many of you in this room uh, will and are campaigning to make sure we are not turned down nicely or otherwise. And all I would say is if you're in a situation where you are caring now, or you know people are caring, contact Carers UK, join the carers movement, be part of a vibrant movement for change that recognises that caring is one of the most important things any of us ever do in our lives, and one of the most important things that our society relies on. The value of our care is £132 billion a year. That's about the same as the NHS. It's bigger than the GDP of New Zealand. And to bring you right up to date, it's 660 times the cost of the latest James Bond film. <laughs> so carers are worth it. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Jane Hawking, married for 30 years to Professor Stephen Hawking, the world-famous physicist. Jane. First question directed up to the gallery. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm afraid um, you're going to find my talk a terrible disappointment after Helena's um, resounding uh, message on behalf of Carers UK because I am not speaking as I am advertised on new challenges in caring. The title of my talk is From Film to Book and Beyond. So if anybody would like to get up and leave, they're very welcome to. <laughs> it's delightful to be here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Lucy Cavendish with you, but I'll come to that later. I have a few um, observations to make about that. Now, how would you respond if someone came to your door, quite out of the blue, asking to make a film about you and your family? Would you like it? Come on, would you like it? <laughs> well, this is what happened to me when in 2004, Anthony McCartan, a scriptwriter from New Zealand, came to ask if I would allow him to make my memoir into a film. And my answer was an emphatic no. And it was an emphatic no annually on each of Anthony's visits. The thing is, a film broadcasts on a large screen to a mass audience. I prefer to share intimate matters with my individual reader. And anyhow, the time was not right for any of us in the family to contemplate having a film made about us. But first of all, I should answer an even more basic question. Why write a memoir? Why expose yourself and your family to the public gaze? Well, I have three answers to that recurrent question. The first, of course, is that my husband, Stephen Hawking, was and has become a world famous physicist. Famous not only on account of his scientific genius, but also on account of the horrendous, wasting neurological condition that he has suffered from for 52 years. It was a long time before I could reconcile myself even to writing a memoir about my life with him. But then I realized that his fame, that fame on account of his genius and on account of the illness, had drawn us all into the public gaze. So I felt that I had no option 
but to write down my own definitive account of all those long years spent together. And I say definitive because in my mind I carried a huge burden of memories, all of them very visual and very precise, but the weight of them was preventing me with getting on with my own life after the divorce. So the only remedy was to write them all down. But thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, I wanted to draw attention. I wanted to capture the attention of all the authorities, the government, the NHS, doctors, nurses, and the general public to the horrors of, neuro of motor neurone disease and of the plight of the victims and of their families, particularly of the family members who act as carers. The question of a film, now to be based on my memoir, called Travelling to Infinity, which I have here, kept rearing its head. There was at one stage the possibility of a Hollywood producer taking the project on, but that for me was the worst of all worlds. How could a Hollywood producer have any idea of what life was like in Cambridge in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on? And I dreaded the thought of seeing us all being played by American actors. And I have to apologize to my little American grandchildren for saying that, but nevertheless, I feared that Hollywood would, would sensationalize the story, and that was the last thing that I wanted. Suddenly, in 2013, Anthony McCartan and I received an invitation to the offices of the best British film company, Working Title. Working Title is responsible for some of the most amazing films, the Bridget Jones films for a start, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Bean, and so on. This was an invitation I could not refuse. So I went along to working title, but in a defiant mood. And I insisted that any film had to be sincere, sensitive, and accurate, true to life. By the end of the meeting, the charged atmosphere subsided into an amicable recognition that actually, perhaps we could do business together. Throughout the summer of 2013, versions of Anthony McCartan's scripts kept coming into my inbox, and I returned them with the email equivalent of the red pen all the way through. But my objections were mostly ignored, except for two triumphs. The deletion of all references to Cambridge University as a campus. <laughs> Although I have to say, I see that Lucy Cavendish describes itself as a campus on its internet um, website. And even worse, well, I managed to delete it anyhow, were untold mentions on every page of the four-letter F word, which scientists did not use in the 60s, the 70s, and they do not use it now. I protested, and this is also in Anthony's script, that there is no huge mammoth statue of Queen Victoria in Cambridge. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the tourist office, they have streams of tourists coming in to ask, where is the statue of Queen Victoria? <laughs> I protested that Stephen did not cox the boat in Cambridge, but in Oxford. 
I protested that postgraduate students are not set preliminary tests before they go on to do their PhDs, that I was not a Cambridge undergraduate when Stephen and I met, but had just left school, and that we met in our hometown of St Albans, not Cambridge. Unfortunately, lazy journalists are now consigning such errors to print, which is just what I did not want. In September 2013, Jonathan, my second husband and I, on our return from France, found that the filming was in full swing. We watched some of it, were perplexed that it was all taking place in St. John's College, not Trinity Hall or Keys, where Stephen has associations. But that's another story. We met Eddie Redmayne, Felicity Jones, and Charlie Cox, the principal actors. We took part in the fake May Ball. But soon, the moat of her homes disappeared as quickly as they had come. And we heard no more until May 2014, when we were invited to a private screening at the offices, or rather in the underground cinema of working title. We were bowled over by the film, by the disturbing recreation of our past lives and by the power of emotions it portrays. I was disturbed to see myself as a teenager on the big screen because that shy, uncertain young woman was me. Felicity had captured my gestures, my speech patterns, my movements, and she was even wearing one of my dresses. <laughs> Charlie Cox, who plays my husband Jonathan, doesn't look at all like him, but portrays all his gentle, caring qualities. And as for Eddie Redmayne's performance, what can I say? It's phenomenal. But can I ask who's seen The Theory of Everything? Oh, hooray, I'm speaking to the initiated. That's good <laughs> news. But a day or two later, we began to query some of the errors and the omissions in the film. Many features of our lives were omitted. For instance, our travels, beginning with our honeymoon at a physics conference <laughs> at Cornell University in upstate New York. It was followed that winter by a conference in Miami where we stayed in the Fontainebleau Hotel, where Goldfinger had been filmed. I hoped that nobody was going to come and paint me in gold paint. Two years later, there was an extended trip, again to the United States, which began in Seattle. There, either I had to drive a monstrous vehicle having only just passed my driving test in this country, my driving test in my red mini, and there the limousine was about, oh, I don't know, as, as, as long as you can imagine. Or I had to walk with Stephen on one arm and a six-week-old baby on the other. Robert, our first child, had just learned to sleep through the night in Cambridge, but with a 10-hour flight and an eight-hour time change, in Seattle, he was awake all night and asleep all day. Nor is there any reference in the film to the year we spent in California in 1974, when somehow, I don't quite know how, I managed to pack up the whole family and transport them to the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, near Los Angeles. The film contains not a glimpse of our several trips to Moscow at the height of the Cold War, 
when most Russian scientists wisely refused to come into the vast Hotel Rossiya, except for one who delighted in sitting for hours, loudly broadcasting his achievements in the cause of Soviet science to the ceiling, probably to a microphone hidden up there somewhere. We witnessed the drab, wearying queues for food, so typical of the Soviet system. Yet, certain of its, its citizens enjoyed several enjoyed special privileges. For instance, there was the sumptuous dinner in a spacious apartment belonging to one of Stephen's colleagues. The dinner was given by the physicist's ostentatious wife. She, as the daughter of a hero of the revolution, was entitled to buy her food and everything else in special shops. We were invited on many occasions to the Bolshoi. Stephen loved the opera. I loved the ballet. He hated the ballet, and I tolerated the opera. It reminded me of how, soon after our marriage, I took him to a performance of Giselle at the Arts Theatre here. He complained of a headache in the first act, and I had to take him home in the interval, whereupon he made a miraculous recovery. <laughs> However, back in Moscow, sadly perplexing, were the tiny decommissioned churches, deconsecrated and empty, painted in white, gold, green and red, peeping out from among the monstrous blocks of Soviet communism, just as Stephen's colleagues shone with wit, kindness, and culture, despite living in a gray, bureaucratic, totalitarian state. Even more extraordinary, from my point of view, was the minimalizing in the film by about 95% of the struggles caused by motor neurone disease, giving a sanitized view of the illness for public consumption. As Stephen's fame grew and glittering prizes were showered upon him, I had to reconcile myself to the realization that there were two facets to our lives. One was the bright, shining public image of success. The other was the dark, private image of despair and exhaustion at home. On our marriage, I wanted Stephen to fulfill his great potential, given the, the damning prognosis of two years to live that he had received in 1963. He responded with courage and purpose, wasting not a moment of his time to pursue his idol, the goddess of physics. But we found that NHS care was not tailored to the needs of the patient, even though that patient was working full-time, and paying his taxes. So, instead of frustratingly long visits to the doctors for regular injections of vitamin B12 or to the hospital for physiotherapy, I looked elsewhere and found alternatives in the form of obli an obliging college nurse who came to give the injections and a grant from the Institute of Physics for domiciliary physiotherapy. As for extra help, such as bathing, once I had a young family, an NHS carer came, but at four o'clock one afternoon. That once, Stephen agreed to be fetched home for his, from his office for a bath, but never again. So after that, it was business as usual for me 
bathing the children first in the early evening and Stephen later, at a normal time, without interruption to his all-important worship at the shrine of his personal goddess. I don't know whether you know, but Mrs. Einstein cited physics as the grounds for her divorce. Gradually, motor neurone disease took its toll, initially consigning a very resistant Stephen to a wheelchair so that family excursions consisted of Stephen in the chair with the baby strapped in in his lap, the toddler dancing along beside the chair and me pushing from behind, or loading everyone plus wheelchair into the car. The strain of keeping house, shopping, driving, single-handedly looking after my very disabled husband and our adorable two small children unaided was overwhelming. Holidays were even more of a strain. So when in the film Felicity says, I can't do all this, she really meant it. There was also that aspect of motor neurone disease which had first appeared at the physics conference at Cornell when one evening Stephen was seized with a terrible choking fit. These would become the most dangerous and frightening aspect of the disease, leading to many a sleepless night, trying to calm the cough, control the panic, before the demands of the next day. My guilt at my own inadequacy grew as I saw my children becoming surrogate arms and legs for their father when I could no longer cope. It was even then that they became part of that army of one million children who still today are responsible for the care of a disabled parent. Despite all this, I became a fierce battler for the rights of the disabled. I wrote to the city surveyor asking for curbs to be lowered to enable me to push my husband into town to Marks and Spencer's. He wrote back to say he couldn't understand why any disabled person would want to buy their own clothes in Marks and Spencer's. I wrote to the director of the National Trust after we'd been turned away from Anglesey Abbey one afternoon and to the director of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, after Stephen had been dropped by a couple of very elderly ushers commissioned to carry him up the stairs into the stalls. Jack Ashley, the admirable father of your president, introduced the Disabled Persons Act in 1970, though its passage through Parliament was very slow and it was a long time before it was fully enforced. As the illness strengthened its grip on Stephen's throat, his voice shrank to a whisper, which only I, our children, and a few students could understand. So one or other of us had to be in constant attendance as his interpreter, whether for a drink of water or for someone to take down his latest discovery, for example, that black holes are not as black as they seem, but can radiate energy. This was the discovery which would lead to the fellowship of the Royal Society at the unprecedented age of 32, and many awards, including honors from the Queen. In 1985, Stephen fell critically ill in Geneva, when he finally emerged from hospital nearly four months later, he was totally dependent on 24-hour specialized care, which I, with no experience in the field, had set up for him. After writing scores of begging letters to a charitable organization in the United States. The carers came from advertisements in the local paper there being no support or help from the NHS. Then the nightmare really began. Some carers came for one session but couldn't cope. 
Others simply left us in the lurch and we had to call the agency. I always had to be present to ensure that the nurses attended to each one of Stephen's personal needs. Even the regular team that emerged from the chaos proved to be unmanageable. One was an alcoholic who helped herself to the contents of the drinks cupboard in the dead of night. Another collected up any odd coins she found lying around. Yet another called a noisy meeting to demand holiday pay, sickness pay, and all sorts of perks which we couldn't offer. One did a war dance around Stephen's bed because I told her we couldn't ask the university to provide her with a mortgage. Today, there is still a long way to go in the provision of services for people who have some sort of disability. Again, I can speak from experience. The battle to obtain the proper services and education for my darling autistic grandson has been long and depressing for us and for my daughter, a single parent. Why do people who are already faced with a traumatic, intractable problem have to fight for their rights? On a different issue, my parents in their 80s were dependent on a disparate bunch of agency carers. My mother's jewelry disappeared, but as there was no proof of theft, and paid carers are not subject to any police vetting procedures. There was no redress. My in-laws in their 90s employed private carers and simply watched their life savings disappear in paying the hefty fees. We have neighbours in an even worse situation. The NHS nurse comes once a week to the disabled husband. So they have to pay agency carers to come twice daily. But the carers are usually untrained Eastern Europeans who, with no English, take up caring as temporary employment before finding a better job. Often the wife, who was a nurse herself, finds that she has to train the paid carers. She has no respite care and is worn out. In the 1980s, with paid carers in the house, constantly disregarding the family and forcing us into a metaphorical corner, my own identity sank without trace. I was exhausted physically, mentally, and emotionally. Unrecognizable as that younger self who had arrived in Cambridge some 20 years earlier, full of optimism and determined to fight the disease. But I want to conclude by returning to those early years in a rather different perspective. In that first year of our marriage, my final year as an undergraduate in London, Stephen could still just about look after himself. So I would leave for the station on a Monday morning and dash to catch the train back to Cambridge on a Friday evening. After graduation, I realised that wives and mothers were nobodies in Cambridge academic society. So I had to create an identity for myself by starting a PhD on the medieval love lyrics of the Iberian Peninsula. It was probably the longest PhD anybody's ever, ever written. Not long in, in size so much, but long in time. But early in 1967, dear Nor Dorothy Needham, the distinguished wife of Joseph Needham, the master of keys, where Stephen was a research fellow, introduced me to a fledgling academic society for mature students, initially just women. Can you guess? That society was none other than Lucy Cavendish. It was pioneered by two scientists, Anna Bidder and Kate Bertram, and a few other of their colleagues. I went to meet them in a very small house in Northampton Street, 
where the college had its premises. They kindly took me on as an affiliated research student, one of the first. This connection allowed me to acquire MA status within the university, which in turn afforded me the all-important privilege of borrowing books in the university library. And there I worked happily until Robert was born and we went to Seattle. Thereafter, the work had to be done in odd moments because my baby always wanted to help me. There was no crash in those days before women's lib, so I depended on my mother's visits to be able to dash into the university library to look something up or to go to a seminar in London where I was registered. But with careful provision for Robert and Stephen, I managed to go out a couple of times a term to the Lucy Cavendish dining nights, which took place in Churchill College. As a recently founded society, Lucy Cavendish could afford to dispense with the outmoded trappings of collegiate life. Since its mature students were likely to be older than some members of staff, segregating students from fellows was not appropriate. So the most junior student, i.e. me, could find herself sitting next to a very senior fellow. Dorothy Emmett, the theologian perhaps, or Hilda Davidson, the Norse scholar, or Natasha Squires, the Russian specialist, or Mrs. Cheney, the medieval scholar, or even Kate, Bitter, Kate Bertram, who was unfailingly kind and encouraging, or Anna Bidder, the president. As the sole hispanist, it was sometimes difficult for me to find common ground, especially since these women, some of whom had four or five children, seemed to give the impression that they had combined families and careers effortlessly. But then, three years later, a new influx of students brought Hannah Skolnikov, a Shakespearean scholar from Israel. She and I sat together at dinner and found that we had much in common. Since then, we have been lifelong friends. My problem of professional isolation was resolved by an introduction to Peter Dronker, the exemplary medieval Latin scholar, and his wife, Ursula, herself a distinguished Anglo-Saxon scholar. They invited me to their highly stimulating evening seminars, where the topics under discussion ranged through the full extent of medieval literature and philosophy, including discussions on medieval Spain. However, by the early 80s, having finally completed my PhD and with a new burden, a new baby and a massive burden of responsibilities, I felt that I no longer had much to offer Lucy Cavendish. My fund of conversation was very limited, so I let my membership lapse. The college, which by now had been given full collegiate status in the university, was much larger and had acquired premises in Lady Margaret Road, where, in a cost-cutting move, guinea pigs were employed to keep the lawns in trim. This was only partially successful, as the said guinea pigs had a way of escaping and eating the flowering plants instead. Understandably, the college now required all its members to commit themselves as potential teachers and this I did not feel able to do, though I did eventually take up sixth form teaching and much later supervising with some sense of fulfillment. So you see, Madam President, members of the audience, this anniversary holds a greater significance for me than you might have expected, and I wholeheartedly wish Lucy Cavendish every success for its next 50 years. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Jane, thank you very much for that fantastic talk. And we had no idea of your connection really with Lucy Cavendish. <laughs> so that's fantastic to hear. And Helena, thank you very much to you as well. Now, we're coming up for a break shortly because I'm aware you've all been sitting for a very long time. And uh, just before you go, we're going to have a, another complete change of tone. Aisha Hazarika, who is a comedienne, Aisha, would you like to step forward? Is going to do Can a little sketch for us. So if you